Good evening, everyone. My name is Susan Edwards, and I'm the executive director of the Museum of Old Newbury. And it's a pleasure to welcome you all tonight to Watching the Moon, our virtual lecture series. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Bill Quigley. Uh, Bill is a, a member of the faculty at the Governor's Academy in Byfield. He's also the founder of the Writing Center at the Academy and a coach um, for varsity teams. And also he is a member of the uh, Museum of Old Newbury's Board of Directors. So it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Bill and uh, one of his former students here tonight uh, for what promises to be a fascinating evening. Please join me in welcoming Bill Quigley. Thank you, Susan. Hi, and welcome everybody this evening. You know, once in a, in a, in a great while, a, a student does something that's really surprising, that's exceptional, and that's truly extraordinary. Never before in my 35 years of teaching have I known a high school student to be published by a major magazine, never mind a serious deliberative publication like Foreign Policy. Neither in March of 2019 did the editors of Foreign Policy know that they were publishing the work of an 11th grade student. That prodigy is our speaker tonight, Tianyu Fang of Beijing, China. Having graduated from the Governor's Academy last spring, Tian Yu is now a first year student at Stanford University. In February of 2019, when Tian Yu submitted a 1500 word essay to foreign policy, he identified himself only as quote, a freelance writer focusing on politics, tech and Asia. Indeed, Tian Yu has been writing for major news outlets for several years now. In its production this past fall of a half hour documentary on the subject of Tian Yu's presentation to us tonight, the BBC radio featured Tian Yu among university professors with scholarly expertise on this subject. And neither did the BBC know that Tian Yu was a high school junior when he wrote that essay for foreign policy and that he's now a college freshman. A prodigy, yes, and also a poster child for what education can and should be at all levels, not just academic classroom exercises, training students to achieve on standardized tests, but critical thinking, discovery, and achieving real world connections and understandings. We would not be here tonight if Tian Yufang had approached his historical research assignment in his AP US history class, merely as an exercise to check off on his way to graduation from high school. He composed and submitted his essay to foreign policy, which he derived from his research, then work in progress, entirely on his own initiative, two months before that assignment was even due in class. How many teenage students do you know who would do something like that? Who'd even think to do it? It's uncommon to say the least. And so it's with great admiration that I introduce you to this prodigious scholar, my friend and a true man of the world, Tian Yu Fang. He is here with us tonight. He will be live answering questions afterwards. Uh, he has pre recorded this presentation just to make sure that there aren't any internet connection problems in the midst of his presentation. So what you will be viewing now is a recording that he made earlier today, and then he will answer questions live afterward about that. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to this presentation. My name is Tian Yu Fang. Um, I'm a first year student at Stanford University, though I've been uh, uh, taking virtual classes from my home here in Beijing, China uh, for the past year or so. But I'm also a class of 2020 graduate at the Gummers Academy in Byfield. So uh, it's nice, uh, you know, to have this opportunity to talk to a home audience. 
Um, so I really, I'm really missed being in Massachusetts. I really miss the weather and even the winter somehow. Uh, so, so that's you know first time having that thought. So I, I, I miss, I miss that place a lot. Uh, so it's really my, uh, my honor to be here today. And thank, thank you so much for for coming. I hope you are all staying safe and well, uh, getting vaccinated or have been vaccinated already. Uh, but yeah, let's begin. Uh, I'll, I look forward to. Um, what we have to discuss today. I'm going to share my slides uh, here. So my presentation is actually based off a, a history project that I started uh, my junior year with uh, my history instructor at Governors, uh, Mr. Bill Quigley. Uh, he, you know, we, uh, my story was on this Chinese scientist who was trained in the United States and, you know, he was about to uh, become a citizen, but McCarthyism and Red Scare basically, uh, basically, uh, you know, forced him to to leave the country. And after he left, he became one of the greatest uh, scientists and, and rocket scientists, missile scientists uh, in, in, in China and Mao. Uh, so, you know, in China, he's a very much praised figure, but uh, I was glad to have the opportunity to learn about his story while he was in the United States. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction of who, who Xue Shen Tian is. Uh, so actually, you know, when he was in the United States, he went by H.S. Tian, uh, his initials. Uh, but, you know, the name was later rendered as, uh, as Tian Xue Shen, the one begins with a Q. Uh, yeah, in the you know, new Chinese ping in the Chinese romanization uh, scheme, uh, but for my own project, I've been using the uh, well the, the original spelling that that he used while he was uh, living uh, in America. Uh, so so this is him. Uh, this is Tian. Uh, he was born in China in 1911 uh, to a very wealthy uh, merchant family. His mother uh, was one of the few Chinese women who was actually literate. Uh, you know, was very rare, very rare back in uh, Qing China, uh, and his father uh, was a uh, was an educator uh, who went to Japan to study study education, study the Western sciences, and he wanted to modernize China after he came back. Uh, and Tian himself was obviously a very smart person. He was intelligent and hardworking enough to get into the very selective Chaozhou University uh, in Shanghai. Uh, which is one of the top universities for engineering and, and the sciences, and it still is today. Uh, and uh, after he graduated in 1935, he went on a Oxford Rebellion scholarship uh, uh, to study at MIT for his master's degree. Well, the Oxford Rebellion scholarship uh, was actually, you know, when the Chinese government paid what the Western countries uh, for for the Box Rebellion that happened in the 19th century, uh, the U.S. received money, but the U.S. government also wanted to uh, reinvest that money uh, back to uh, Chinese students and Chinese sciences and Chinese education. So they established uh, using that money, uh, Tsinghua University, which is still one of the top universities in China, and also they funded a bunch of Chinese students to to study in America. And Tian was one of them. Uh, it was a very selective process, actually. Uh, he got his master's at MIT, for some reason hated Boston, uh, I don't know why, probably the weather uh, or the accent, I don't know. Um, and then he joined uh, Caltech to study under Theodore uh, von Karman, uh, who was a Hungarian-American physicist, and he was one of the top physicists in the entire United States, uh, and he, he re-elected there, uh, and he became part of what's called, what was called a suicide squad. Uh, because he was really into rocket science, and rocket science was something that people had almost never heard of uh, in the 1930s, if you think about it. Uh, so he apparently hit him and four or five other friends were, you know, doing all these da dangerous um, experiments in their lab all day. So he would call them the, the suicide squad, and that squad became uh, the Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory. Uh, in 1943, and that became the precursor to NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, you know, which still exists today. 
uh, and Tian was actually involved in uh, many major, uh, many U.S. scientific efforts during the Second World War, and that includes the Manhattan Project. Um, and he also went to Germany, he went to Nazi Germany after the war to investigate and inve examine uh, Germany's uh, own scientific programs uh, and to to see see what they've got there. So he was very much involved in uh, uh, all the U.S. academia, but also U.S. military efforts, uh, especially in the scientific arena. Oh yeah, this is the only joke. Here's him saying, "Oh, actually, it is rocket science." This is the only joke uh, in this presentation. I haven't prepared much. Uh, my my sense of humor has been uh, declining due to the, the the pandemic. So so there's that. Um, hope you all laughed at it, at the joke. Um, so let's go to the next page. Things changed very rapidly in the year of 1949. Uh, so there are two important figures. One of them is Senator Joseph McCarthy, uh, who started the whole wave of McCarthyism, the the Red Scare. Uh, in the 1940s and 1950s, well, he was the person who told, uh, who who said that there were communists uh, who infiltrated the U.S. government. So he started uh, the, uh, the activities uh, and the investigations via the House and American Activities Committee uh, to persecute, to investigate, to uh, find out who these infiltrators were, not just in the U.S. government, but also in academia, at universities, on campuses, uh, they were doing a lot of investigations and targeted a lot of leftist uh, scientists uh, and scholars uh, in universities. And, you know, these people were considered the sympathizers, um, you know, who sympathized with, you know, communism, the evil ideology, quote unquote, uh, but also, you know, the Soviet Union uh, and, and, um, and that, you know, unfree world. Uh, and the same in the same year, in, also in 1949, uh, you know, we saw the emergence of the Chinese Communist Party becoming taking power in China, and this is what this is what um, you know a lot of the right wing uh, people back then would call the loss of China. I have a lot of problems with that term, uh, and, and but you know here it was, and Mao, here's Mao Zedong announcing his victory uh, at Tiananmen Square, uh, announcing his victory against the the Chiang Kai Shek. Kuomintang regime, a nationalist party, uh, which was backed by the U.S. government. And at the same time, there was continued legal discrimination against Asian Americans, against Chinese Americans, and, you know, Asian immigrants, especially. Uh, if you think about it, there was the, uh, uh, China, the, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 19, 1882, was still in effect. Uh, Chinese people could not uh, immigrate to the United States uh with some exceptions, and Tian was one of the exceptions. He was a uh, student on a scholarship, um, and they could not become citizens, uh, and they could not naturalize. And in the same time, there was also the Johnson Reed Act, which only gave a very small quota uh, for for immigrants who who, who came from Asia uh, in the in the 1940s. So it was during this time. When Tian found his social circle at Caltech, uh, his best friends was uh, actually Frank Molina, who was also a, um, I guess one of his best friends, I should say. Uh, Molina was one of the most, uh, uh, was also a member of the Suicide Squad, also a, a rocket scientist. And there's also Sidney Weinbaum, who was a chemist, an immigrant chemist uh, at Caltech, and a bunch of other, uh, I guess, it would say, uh, scientists and academics at Caltech. And in 1947, just two years earlier, he went on a trip to China to see his family. Uh, it was the first time visiting China since he arrived in the United States in 1935. Uh, you know, the, his own uh, university where he graduated, uh, the Chiaotong University in Shanghai, uh, you know, asked him to become the president of the college. He declined the offer. Uh, he got married in China during the three months he was there. He married his child friend, uh, Ying, uh, and they, they returned to the U.S. together uh, in, in, in 1947, very, very shortly after. Uh, and in 1949, uh, the two, uh, Ying and, uh, and Tian, uh, who, and also their two kids somehow, uh, applied for a U.S. Actually, uh, 
their first kid, just their first kid. They applied for U.S. citizenship uh, in 1949, even though they were not eligible for it uh, because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And he was also in the same year accused of being a Communist Party member in 19 uh, in 1950, actually, uh, well, he had his security clearance revoked. Remember that he was uh, actually working for U.S. Army, the U.S. military the entire time uh, as a scientist or at least an advisor. So he had security clearance uh, and he was identified as a member of like, a car carrying Communist Party member of the professional unit 122 of Pasadena. And that's the Communist Party USA is not the Chinese Communist Party. Um, but the reality was Sidney Weinbaum, uh, who the guy pictured here, he was apparently leading uh, the Communist Party unit uh, in his own home. So Tian uh, had attended many, many meetings or gatherings uh, uh, in, in, his res uh, in Weinbaum's residence and uh, basically the, the Red Squad, the police force that was hunting for, for the Reds, um, you know, had set, claimed that had evidence that Tian was actually a member uh, of the unit. Uh, well, actually, just a little legal background. It wasn't illegal for U.S. citizens to become Communist Party members, but the re the, the reason that Tian was charged off this was because first of all, he had security clearance, so his security clearance would be revoked if he was, if he was found a communist. Uh, and on the other hand. When he re-entered the United States in 1947, he was asked uh, because of uh, because of Cold War protocols, uh, uh, because well, not exactly Cold War, but the, the anti-communist protocols, if he was a Communist Party member, and he said no. So by doing so, if he indeed was a Communist Party member, he will be found uh, he will be charged with perjury uh, because he will have lied to the immigration officials. Now, which will lead to deportation, uh, and that's uh, what they eventually charged him with. So he went through hearings in the 1950 uh, and 1951, but his deportation was eventually ordered in 1951. Uh, but in the same time, the U.S. Department of Justice had blocked him from leaving America. And, you know, there are many theories about why this was, and some say, you know, this was like, direct uh, uh, notice, direct uh, directives uh, from from the State Department. But at the same time, you know, there was uh, a, a historical background. In 1950, uh, the Korean War broke out and China, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, Communist China, uh, was on the side of the North Koreans, the DPRK. Uh, and suddenly, you know, before, before a Korean War broke out, Chinese students were told that there were uh, welcome to, to, to stay in America. And, and when the Korean War broke out, the Chinese, the U.S. government basically banned Chinese scientists, uh, a, lot, a lot of Chinese students, but mostly scientists, from leaving the United States. Uh, and there is a very detailed account uh, in, in Ye Long Han's um, paper, An Untold Story, American Policy Towards Chinese Students in the United States, 1949 to 1955. This is a paper you can find on JSTOR. There's a very detailed legal account. So Tian was actually confined to Los Angeles County, was under constant surveillance. He wanted to go home, but uh, uh, he, he was trying to, to go back to China. Uh, and there was a deportation order, but it was never, uh, it wasn't allowed to be execute, uh, implemented, executed, uh, just because there was also like a higher level order that was blocking this deportation order. Uh, but after, you know, Unofficial talks between U.S. and China over the five uh, over the five year period. Uh, there were a few talks in Geneva, and, and Tian was you know writing notes and you know sending them in like secretly to his uh, you know friends in Europe, his uh, family members in Europe, uh, asking uh, for a Chinese government's help to get him back to China. So there was this de facto prisoners of war exchange in 1955. Uh, to allow Tian, along with a bunch of other Chinese students, to return to to uh, China, Ch the Chinese um, nation, uh, while it was under Mao's rule, you know the State Department denied there was a, there was an exchange like this, uh, but that's exactly what is this effectively effectively what actually happened. So this was the 
Department of Justice letter to to Tian, uh, allowing him. You know, it says you know, <coughs> the the order of this service dated August 23, 23rd, nineteen fifty, has been revoked, and you may now depart from the United States, and there will be no difficulty, uh, in 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 doing so. So you know that was the order. He only got it five years later. So you know he had a lot of. Uh, he was first of all enraged that he was accused of being a communist, which he said he wasn't a communist party member. Uh, but also he was very uh, angry, uh, amongst other sentiments, that he was basically under surveillance for five years without being allowed to do anything. You know, couldn't leave uh, his country. Uh, the United States couldn't go home, couldn't do his work because he didn't have security clearance. Um, so he was just there waiting to be deported. I guess that brings us to uh, the story after he, he left for China. Uh, in 1955, he boarded on uh, a ship to Hong Kong. And, and via Hong Kong, he settled down in Beijing and became a staunch Maoist. Uh, he was... Tian, you know, I mean, it's hard to believe uh, this guy was writing uh, editorials in the party newspaper praising uh, Mao, uh, denouncing his uh, uh, the U.S. government, you know, which was not really, which was actually really understandable. But he was he became a really staunch Maoist, professing his loyalty to the country, professing his loyalty to the party, professing his loyalty to Mao. And if you think about it from a Chinese perspective, this wasn't unusual, and it made sense because you know, if you think about who Mao was. Uh, sorry, if you think about who Tian was, he came from a very wealthy background. You know, that's not going to be good for for his career or his like safety. Uh, he his wife uh, was uh, <coughs> excuse me, his wife was the daughter of the Nationalist Party official. Uh, I think his uh, the, the the father was uh, <coughs> very close to Chiang Kai Shek, who had fled Taiwan, and he was the number one wanted person in China. Uh, also, he himself uh, had lived in America for so long uh, that people was very people were very sus suspicious of his loyalty. So he had to constantly like uh, you know hype up uh, or like you know express that he was loyal, he was patriotic in order to survive. Uh, also, yeah, he, he did survive the anti rightist movement in 1957. He did uh, survive the 10 years of Cultural Revolution. There were uh, interesting tales of uh, people were trying to stage a coup d'etat against, uh, against Tian uh, in his own ministry. Uh, and those were recorded in uh, Iris Chang's book, Thread of the Silkworm, which is a biography of Tian, and they're like very interesting details. Uh, but, you know, he was also accused of allowing for the Great Leap Forward. The Great Leap Forward was the three-year famine uh, in, in Maoist China. And Mao basically saying, you know, we should you know, maximize all these agricultural production. And people pointed to, to, to one of Tian's, um, one of the editorials uh, with, with Tian's byline, and in, in which Tian supposedly wrote uh, that, you know, um, like, it's, it's actually possible to produce this much uh, agri agriculture produce uh, in like uh, in, like this period of time, which was like a, a number that was unimaginable. Uh, so he kind of hyped that up uh, a bit. Some people accused that, and I think a, a, an interview uh, with uh, Tian's own son, uh, published in recent month, actually in the past year, uh, uh, revealed that you know this article was actually not written by Tian. It was just some reporter who misquoted him and wrote a, wrote an entire editorial about it, uh, but it was actually not written by Tian himself, and he never bothered to to dispute that because that was that later became the policy of uh, of, of Mao himself, and he wouldn't want to you know be in trouble for that. So there was a lot of uh, uh, controversies about his uh, political actions. Uh, uh, during the Mao period, but in the same time, he was the one who helped develop, who led the development of China's first missiles, China's first rocket, uh, China's first satellite. You know, uh, when he first returned to China, he was completely um, 
uh, what's the right for it? He didn't. He had had no idea where to start because if you think about it, while at Caltech, they had the best equipments of the entire world back then. But when he came to China, the entire institute he was at, they only had one telephone. The entire institute. Uh, so it, it just felt impossible that he would be able to develop all these things. Uh, but he did. He uh, uh, spent a lot of time at first being a scientist, but also then uh, being an administrator uh, uh, at the uh, at the uh, at the uh, institute. And so a lot of the uh, current missiles and you know uh, rockets, satellites uh, that that China has built in recent years. Uh, were actually influenced by his uh, well early development, early efforts. And Tian never returned to America. He became uh, he he died in two thousand nine. He died a Chinese hero, um, and he refused to talk to American journalists, uh, you know, prior to his death. So um, yeah, so he had very mixed feelings about what America actually uh, how America treated him. Uh, I guess now we can move on to uh, my own research, my own study of of, of uh, Tian in my junior year uh, U.S. history course. And my study was based was uh, about whether he was actually a Communist Party member. Now, it's not a this is not I was not arguing whether he had attended the Communist Party meetings. Uh, he actually did, right? This is what he admitted. Uh, but at the same time, whether he was a Communist Party member was something that historians disputed. So I relied on both primary and secondary sources. For primary sources, I looked into uh, various interviews with not only Tian, but also uh, Tian's uh, former colleagues uh, at Caltech, his friends uh, in America. Uh, and that was the oral history project uh, at the, the Caltech archives. Uh, they basically interviewed a lot of the, the prominent scientists, and some of them talk about Tian's story because he was such an important influence on campus in the 1930s and 40s. And there were also news articles in China and America that I relied on, uh, and government reports that have, and FBI documents that have been recently declassified, by recently, I mean, like, last 25 years. Uh, and there were, and, and Tian's stories uh, there were a lot of sources after he returned to China because of the closed media environment, but he did write editorials, of, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, in Chinese, so I was able to obtain some of them that are available to public. Uh, I also uh, relied on uh, several secondary sources uh, for his uh, for historiography, and one of them is Irish, Irish Chang's uh, Thread of the Silkworm. Uh, you know, she... It was a brilliant biography. She did a lot of research, talked to uh, Tian's own family members, uh, even though Tian refused to talk to her because she was an American journalist. Uh, but that's a different story. Uh, and there was also this article, well, this book chapter in the China Cloud by William Ryan Sam Summerlin. Uh, it was an early account of, of Tian's story uh, in the 1960s. This is when uh, the Chinese, uh, well, the, the American sentiments towards McCarthyism towards the anti-communist fears was starting to to change, mm. and also there was the uh, magazine article "The Bitter Tea of Dr. Tian" in Esquire uh, by by Milton Yurst. Uh, that was in that was from 1967. That was re reprinted a few times uh, afterwards. So I want to give an overview of uh, two predominant views that were uh, relevant to this discussion, and one of them is the traditional view which contends that Tian was a member, a card-carrying member of the Communist Party, uh, Communist Party USA. I mean, he, he later became a Chinese Communist Party member, but that's not uh, what we're discussing here. Uh, so that view relied on two pieces of evidence. And one of them is Tian's own Communist Party membership card, registration card uh, from 1938, when you know he was using the alias that was and and referred to a Chinese name, um, and the second piece of evidence of the is the well the second piece of the of the most incriminating evidence uh, was a testimony from a person named Richard Lewis, uh, who was also a colleague and a member of the Communist Party. He claimed that he believed uh, 
uh, Qian was a member. So so that became the the, the you know the last um, incri incriminating evidence that led to Qian's uh, uh, indictment. Uh, also, Qian's own pu publicized communist views did not, uh, you know, help him. Right? Uh, he was, you know, writing all these op eds supporting the communist government in China uh, after he returned. Uh, so that added to the accusation or allegations that he was indeed a member of the communist party. But there was also a revisionist view that's um, perhaps more favored by most historical scholars. And that's uh, contends that Tian was actually not a member, uh, and the, fir the the refutals were first. The membership card was not actually an original copy; it was presented by the red squad, by the by the police investigators, and these people were not the best. Um, did not have the best reputation for for presenting actual. Uh, making the, the best accusations, right? They're, they're, they, they were constantly wrong, and because of the political climate, uh, they were able to uh, to fabricate a lot of accusations. And, and, and the membership card itself was actually in the handwriting of one of the investigators, and uh, we don't know what the actual copy looks like. And second of all, uh, Richard Lewis was pressured by the FBI, and they I think they had a deal or something, uh, so, uh, apparently Lewis admitted later on that, that he was asked by the FBI to say certain things. No other witness ever testified against Tian with such certainty. Uh, so he was, the, in fact, the only person who said Tian was indeed a member uh, who were there. And, uh, you know, at the same time, Tian, as I said before, Tian was basically forced to uh, express his allegiance to, uh, to, to Mao. Uh, and his ideology is because of China's witch hunts, right? Like the Cultural Revolution, the anti rightist movement, a lot of Tian's Chinese colleagues who returned to China with him or, you know, uh, who are also living, who also lived in the United States or Canada, who returned to China were actually subject to a lot of political violence and uh, investigations, uh, or witch hunt, uh, and, you know, lost their career, lost their family members, even like, uh, uh, you know, lost their own liberty. And lastly, Tian himself might not have been aware of the nature of Weinbaum's meetings. If you think about it, people like Weinbaum, uh, Frank Molina, they were his only friends uh, uh, in, in, in the United States. Uh, this was a time when it was very difficult for Chinese immigrants to socialize, uh, to even survive, because you know there were uh, incidents where he tried to enter a movie theater um, uh, in in a, in, a, uh, in Pasadena in California, uh, and he was turned away, and he was asked to leave uh, because he was Chinese. Uh, he was also not allowed to uh, rent or purchase center, certain houses in a certain neighborhood because of white supremacy. Uh, so it was a very difficult time for Chinese immigrants to uh, to be in America, and these are the only friends he had, and they happened to be leftists. And you know, I, I have no doubt that he was politically leftist as well. But uh, that, that itself does not make him a member of the Communist Party. In the United States, he might have been considered a leftist. Uh, he might have sympathized with socialism. He might have agreed with some of the ideology. Um, but in the same time, considering what he had contributed uh, to America uh, you know, during the Second World War and to the scientific development of the United States itself, uh, those the, the, the supposed communist threat that Tian posed uh, was actually minimal. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of scientists uh, in his social circle uh, who were not from, from China were also persecuted during that time. Linus Pauling, uh, who was a Nobel Prize winner, uh, a, chem a fa very famous chemist, uh, was investigated by McCarthy himself. Uh, he had his passport taken away. Uh, uh, and that humiliated that humiliated him very much, um, and you know he was not a threat to the United States. He was the leading scientist in America, uh, and there was also Fra Frank Molina himself uh, was also worried that he would be persecuted. So uh, before Tian was deported, uh, he left for France to work for UNESCO. 
and, and later became a scientist in France, kept saying that he was just there for work, but in fact, his own son, uh, Roger Molina, revealed uh, in the later years that that Frank Molina, uh, you know, like, like Tian, was, was actually investigated by the FBI, and he just left. While he was in France, he was spied on by the... Um, by, by U.S. agents, uh, so he had to uh, basically uh, stop doing scientific work because he didn't want to contribute to the war effort. Uh, and uh, in 1999, uh, and 19, uh, in two, year 2000, there was this uh, uh, revived sort of uh, sentiment around the China threat, right? This is the book that pu was published by Bill Gertz. Uh, he was a conservative um, pundit uh, who, who argued that, you know, who was very worried about the Chinese, the Chinese government and its uh, military threat, and he's still very active today in, in, in media. Uh, and there was also the 1999 Cox Report, uh, which, you know, investigated China's uh, national security threat uh, to the United States. And, uh, you know, these all came amid uh, China's technological and economic rise in the late 1990s. So, so we're seeing uh, the Cox report, um, you know, citing Tian as a case, as the first case of, of Chinese espionage, uh, and that he had su supposedly stolen technology from the Americas. Uh, and the Cox report was actually very much disputed. A lot of people said it was a uh, real, a lot of experts, including, uh, 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 including the, the leading China experts, invest, uh, read it and, and decided that it was actually full of uh, technical and like factual errors. Uh, but this sentiment was revived uh, after uh, you know in China's technological technological rise, and in the same time, uh, the pop, the paranoia against uh, Chinese researchers, Chinese scientists, and by Chinese I mean ethnic Chinese, they might not even have been from China. Uh, uh, was revived again, and uh, we were seeing the, the new Tians, right? Uh, and in year 2000, uh, we saw the case of Wen Ho Li, who was a Taiwanese American uh, scientist who was um, uh, who was supposedly uh, went to China and uh, stole American technologies uh, uh, for the Chinese government. And in fact, he wasn't even from China; he was a Ta he was born in Taiwan. Uh, he was a Taiwanese American. Um, uh, scientist. He was uh, put in jail for more than 2, uh, 200 days, uh, and uh, the the FBI did not collect enough evidence to 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 charge him uh, with indictments that they have for him. And the second picture in the middle is Sherry Chen. Uh, she was a Chinese American researcher, uh, a hydro hydrologist uh, at the National Weather Service. Um, you know she. Uh, was also indicted for uh, for uh, espionage. There was no concrete evidence that could prove it. And what was probably the more the more famous case was a more recent case is uh, the case of Xiao Xingxi, uh, who was a fi uh, professor at uh, Temple University in Philadelphia, was also uh, accused of spying for the Chinese government. There was no evidence provided. Uh, the entire lawsuit uh, bankrupted him and his family. Uh, still owes debt because of uh, the lawsuit. There was no apology issued uh, and, and no no um, uh, reparations uh, 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 from from uh, uh, the investigations that he was subject to, uh, and his fame was uh, very much um, his reputation was very much ruined because of the case. Uh, but there was no solid proof that he had actually involved in espionage for China. Uh, so, uh, and this is still happening. Uh, we're seeing the recent case of uh, MIT Skang Chen. Uh, he was a, he's a Chinese American uh, scientist and professor uh, who's been an American citizen for a very long time. Uh, was accused of uh, accepting um, uh, money from the Chinese government uh, and not disclosing his uh, uh, grants from from a foreign government. Uh, but uh, most people in academia defended him. Um, and, and that case is uh, still going on. Uh, so we're still seeing this uh, sort of um, paranoia uh, and also racial profiling against uh, Chinese American scientists uh, that, you know, remind me of the case of, of Tian uh, and make me think about, you know, whether these were 
you know, all these accusations on national security ground were actually valid, and, and whether those were, you know, your, whether your sh the United States is shooting some foot. And uh, I want to present two quotes uh, to uh, to end my presentation before the end of this, you know, my introduction of the presentation. Uh, and the first one is from uh, the a journalist uh, from the Christian Science Monitor reporting the one whole case in 2000. And Peter Greer said, if there is any conclusion for, for today to be drawn from the Tian affair, it is perhaps that the greatest U.S. security losses can be self-inflicted. And the other is from uh, Daniel A. Kimball, uh, who witnessed and uh, was a former uh, Navy secretary and who uh, witnessed uh, uh, the, the, the Tian's deportation case uh, when he was an, an, a Navy undersecretary. Uh, he said later that it was the stupidest thing that this country ever did. He was no communist. He was no more a communist than I was, and we forced him to go. Uh, so indeed, I think it's a, a very sad story that not only has historical significance, but still uh, still impacts you know Chinese American uh, scientists, uh, researchers, students, and and you know people of of, of Asian descent in the United States today. Uh, and you know this is something I'm worried about personally. Uh, because I care a lot about the relations between U.S. and China and the plight um, of, uh, you know, uh, of 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 uh, immigrants who who migrate between the two countries, myself included, uh, and I think the great strength that America has uh, in today's world is its ability to attract uh, talent uh, from all over the world. Uh, I know for a fact that the world's best uh, tech, tech talent. Uh, are, are not moving to China, they're trying to move to America, they're trying to move to Silicon Valley. Uh, and, and that's America's greatest strength. And if if um, if the Tian the, the Xue Shen Tian story is happening again and again, uh, that's that would be a loss, not just for America, but also uh, the people involved uh, uh, in, in the, the collateral damage, the people who are caught in, in the crossfire. Uh, so that was personally why uh, I care about this story so much, and I, I spent a lot of time researching it. Uh, and uh, I'll, like, I hope I hope you guys uh, enjoyed uh, what I talked about, and also uh, became interested in this story. I have some recommended readings that I uh, will post uh, in the in the comments section later on. Uh, so I actually. Um, wrote a few articles. I, I was involved in a few articles uh, related to to Tian story. I wrote an uh, article for a foreign policy magazine. It was only on web, uh, but it's called "The Man Who Took China to Space." It has um, more detailed account of the story. Uh, I was also involved in a BBC radio production uh, that was published in uh, October 2020. Uh, it's called "Tian Shui Sen: The Man the U.S. Deported Who Who Then Helped China Into Space." Uh, so I was appeared in the radio. I was also um, interview for for the written story, the web story. Uh, I also recommend uh, the the biography written by Eric Chain, Thread of the Silkworm, is probably the most uh, comprehensive biography of Tian. Uh, there is also a Chinese uh, book that I've been recently uh, read, uh, I've recently picked up after I came back to China. Uh, so I think these are probably useful material materials uh, if you're interested uh, in this uh, in this uh, topic. So I'll be happy to take uh, questions. I mean, this is right now. This is a um, recorded uh, video, so I'll, I'll go back to live uh, to take questions, and I'm happy to um, answer answer your questions. And if I don't if I don't get to answer your question publicly, uh, please feel free to reach out to my uh, my email address uh, so I can respond uh, privately um, uh, through email, and I'll be, be I'll be happy to do that. I right, thank you so much. That was a wonderful and compelling uh, presentation, uh, Tian Yu, and thank you so much. Um, let's just see if we have any questions in our chat box here. Uh, having having grown up in that uh, 50s period, uh, it was a, a wonderful new perspective uh, for me. We read about it in uh, in high school and college, but hearing your you tonight was truly inspirational. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Now, I'm not seeing any questions right now, but please feel free, any of you, if you have a question that you would like to ask Tianyu um, to do it at, at this time. You've made us all think very, very hard about uh, mistakes that have been made and their consequences. Okay, here's a question uh, from James. Have you compared the US govern government's treatment uh, if uh, Tian uh, to the treatment of, oops, gone away, to the treatment of uh, Werner von Braun? Oh, thank you, Dr. Brayshaw. Uh, I actually, uh, I did, I, I did uh, look up uh, von Braun's story uh, when I was doing, uh, I, did, I did do some reference to his uh, story when I was doing his research, uh, but I, uh, I feel like that was uh, the predominant idea here. Right? Part of it was uh, prioritizing anti-communism over uh, the actual uh, national interests and national security concerns uh, that would have actually uh, impacted uh, uh, the progress of United States uh, scientific development. Uh, but yeah, that's a that's a very great point. Uh, I wish I could done more. Uh, comparisons and parallels into uh, uh, and contrast in, to both stories. I think I think I, I like there's one thing I forgot to mention in my actual presentation was you know how how did what what would have played out if, if Tian Sa wasn't deported. I think it's very difficult for when I was actually working on my research, it was very difficult for me to predict who he uh, who he would have become or what he would have contributed had he stayed in the United States. Uh, but I think one useful frame of reference uh, would be his own uh, uh, cousin, uh, whose name is uh, Xu Chutian, uh, who stayed in the United States. Uh, he was a nationalist of, uh, of a government official. Uh, he was a diplomat and he moved to the United States and stayed uh, in the country uh, and worked for uh, Boeing as the chief engineer uh, there until his retirement. And his both of his children became prominent scientists. His, uh, first, uh, his older son, uh, Roger Tian, uh, was a uh, Nobel Prize winner uh, in chemistry. Uh, and his other son, I think Richard Tian, uh, if I remember the first name correctly, uh, he was a neuro, uh, neuroscientist uh, at NYU. And both of them became very prominent people in, in US science. Uh, and there's a second question. Uh, yeah. How essential was he to the Chinese space program? I'm just, sorry, I'm just moderating this myself. That's okay, uh, that's, that's okay. fine. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I think I think he was the the person who laid the fundamental uh, structure for a scientific development. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there was no there before he came. There was almost nothing. It was some relics uh, of the of the Soviet program that that they borrowed from, uh, but there was there was no uh, there was no nothing. Right, like the day he was in, who, he arrived in the institute. Um, there was only, only only one telephone in the entire uh, entire bureau, uh, so it was it was almost impossible for him to conduct any uh, research. But he was the one who laid the foundation. He built the administrative structure and the bureaucratic structure, and uh, uh, was also the chief engineer there. And I think um, in in one uh, uh, analysis by uh, uh, John uh, John Pomfret, a, Ch a China scholar uh, uh, who studied him a bit uh, in his book, he said that. He was actually the person who introduced the American way of science uh, to China, and before him, uh, it was all this. It was the Soviet, Soviet like methodology, and he was the one who came here and said, "You know what? That's all dated. We should, we should like stick, should, should have this like updated version of like the American methodology." And that really did help. You know, even though he might not, might not have intended that, did help China's uh, uh, reengagement with the United States. Uh, you know, like ap after the Sino-Soviet split in the 1950s. And, you know, like later we knew that like Nixon, Mike Mao and China and the United States renormalized um, relations. And like John Pomfret would argue that he actually played a huge role in this, uh, in the in scientific, uh, uh, scientific arena. Oh, uh, so Holly has another question. I'm curious to know more about the definitions of being a Communist Party, uh, being a Communist member at various times and from different perspective. Uh, was there a legal definition of being a communist at Tian's time in the US? How do historians define it? Do we personally 
also have a definition of some sort of uh, of some sort that you base off of. And I was actually using uh, well the government's definition, which was being a car carrying member, right? Uh, and that's uh, you know uh, it's not about whether you're ideologically uh, communist, uh, which actually would have mattered because uh, I mean many ways is about guilt by association, right? If you're associated with communists, you are a communist and you're suspicious. And, and that's what uh, McCarthy, McCarthyism did uh, to a lot of leftists who, or people who are not even leftists uh, uh, in universities or in, in, in government. Uh, but yeah, like the, the perjury charge would have been uh, that needed proof that he was an actually registered member of the Communist Party. And that's why they needed the car, uh, the, car the certificate uh, for, for evidence. We have a question from um, Bill that says, you spoke of a supposed membership card or list with Tian's name on it or a pseudonym. Can you clarify what that actual evidence was? Oh, it was uh, the, so the FBI agents, or actually I think it's a, probably the police officers, uh, they, they presented a card uh, that has Tian's name on it and a pseudonym that says, uh, uh, you know, back, back then because communist parties were not supposed to be public information. They usually used uh, a pseudonym to, to uh, you know, in, in official documents uh, to, to, to say, oh, this person is, is not, uh, you know, uh, Bill Quigley is, is uh, John, uh, well, I don't know, like John Appleseed, right? Uh, to, to, to make sure that people, people's identities are secret. Now, uh, now there were, but there were actually real names, the actual names of, of party members in the party registration. And so they obtained this one copy of a card that says uh, Tian, uh, Xiu Shen Tian was uh, this name. Uh, but it wasn't, an, uh, when they presented that in court, it wasn't the actual copy or a photocopy of it. Uh, it was uh, rather uh, a, a copy that was handwritten by, 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 the, uh, by the police officers and the police investigators. Uh, so that raised a lot of questions because nobody could prove that this was an actual copy. And it was known at the time that the red squads all over the country uh, were, were very accustomed to fabricating evidence like this, just to prove that uh, there, there, are, there are communist party members to, to, uh, to, uh, to reach their, their, their goals. Well, it looks as though we have no other questions coming in, but I want to say thank you again, uh, Tian Yu, for a very thought-provoking and beautifully presented uh, program. We're very grateful and honored to have had you uh, as part of the Museum of Old Newberry's program series. And thank you to all of our uh, attendees uh, for coming tonight. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. Uh, we have two programs. One is an on-site program. Uh, a walking tour of Old Hill Cemetery with Lee Woodworth. And then on May 20th, we have a closer look at the Cushing House Garden by uh, Cindy Brockway. Uh, so uh, we hope to see, uh, to see you again uh, next month. Thanks very much. Good evening. Thank you, everyone. Good evening.